Hawaii government working for you. I'm Dan Lemieux, County Board Chairman and co-host of this program that we tape monthly. And Adam Payne, our Administrative Coordinator, is, is the other co-host. And on a monthly basis, we try to bring the services and departments that are uh, bringing the services to the Sheboygan County residents for county government. And this week, or this month, we have with us Terry Burke, our Court Commissioner, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Court Commissioner's office and the services that you provide to the uh, residents of Sheboygan County. So Terry, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your position as Court Commissioner. Well, Dan, uh, Madison is my hometown. And in fact, I went to the University of Wisconsin. I got my undergraduate degree there. I went to law school at DePaul University in Chicago. I was hired to be an assistant district attorney in 1984. That was by uh, Ed Stengel, He's, who's now the circuit court judge in Branch 1. And as uh, an assistant DA, I worked there for about four years, and I uh, was responsible for a lot of different types of cases. I started out in the child support agency with uh, support enforcement and paternity establishment. And I was also involved in uh, everything from traffic tickets to, uh, to sexual assaults, you name it. Uh, I did it at one time or another. And uh, in 1988, I uh, had the opportunity to apply for the job of court commissioner. And there had been no full-time court commissioner in Sheboygan prior to that. Uh, there was a family court commissioner uh, who was contracted for by the county. And then in 1988, the county board and the judges wanted to go with a full-time commissioner. And I applied for the position, and I got it. So what are the, what are the qualifications for a court commissioner? Well, you have to be an attorney. Now you have to have at least three years of experience. And you have to be in good standing with the bar and you are appointed by the judges. So in other words, uh, when the day comes that you no longer want to be the court commissioner and, and somebody else would like to have that, that position, it, it's a matter of application, it's not an elected position? It's not an elected position. And it has to be reappointed on an annual basis. Oh, on an annual basis. So somebody, not that we're looking for competition for you, but some, somebody else could apply every year. And you want to keep your voice down. OK, OK. <laughs> but somebody could apply for it, you bet. But every right. January, the position comes up for review. And then what are the main responsibilities and missions of, mission of your department? Well, in discussing our mission, yeah, it's important to look at what the role of the courts are in our society. And uh, what the courts do is offer a forum for people to come to and uh, have their disputes resolved. Uh, we're all imperfect, and disputes happen, like it or not. And they've got to be resolved so people can go on with their lives, and that's the function that the courts perform. So as court commissioner, I have uh, mediation programs that I'm responsible for. So if people are involved in a dispute, it can be sidetracked in, into mediation to see if it could, could perhaps be resolved without the need of, uh, of any court proceeding. Uh, if it does have to go to court, then as court commissioner, I conduct certain proceedings that are delegated to me by the judges. And again, that's to keep things moving along. Uh, there was a study done by the state back in about 1993 or 94 uh, as to how many courts, how many judges every county needed. And at that point, I think the recommendation for Sheboygan was seven judges. Well, that's not going to happen, obviously. That was about the time that Branch 5 was created in 1994. So what various counties do is they delegate authority to court commissioners to assist the courts because they're not going to get the, uh, the funding from the state to have the courts and the, and the staffing that they would need. So what, what is the size of your department? As far as, I mean, we, we can go in a court, and what, what we normally think of as a, as a court, and see the judge and the bailiff and, and, and some just obviously people working in the background. Your department, what, what do you have in your department? Well, right now, as we speak today, my department consists of myself and uh, Susan Kay, who is the assistant court commissioner, and, uh, and, and a tape recorder. Uh, normally, what's happened in the past is I've had a combination court reporter and legal secretary. And we're making a transition right now. It, for a variety of reasons, it's hard finding court reporters. And it's a very difficult thing to do. And the last person I had filling that position ha has left. And she got a job as a, uh, as a uh, official court reporter in Manitowoc County. And because it's a hard position to fill, like I said, we've go on the technological route, and we have a, a tape recorder in, in my courtroom that we use to uh, keep a record of what's going on. And then I'm in the process of hiring a full-time legal secretary. So when we're at full staff, there will be three people. 
Uh, also, uh, I contract with mediators to provide mediation services in, in family court. And Susan Kay, who is the assistant court commissioner, does mediation in small claims court, and she's really responsible for most of the goings on in small claims. You talked a little bit a couple minutes ago about judges sending mediation cases to you and things like this. What is actually the, fortunately, I've, I've, I've not been a, a user of, of the court system good, good. Uh, over the years. When somebody needs to use the court system, maybe you could just go over a little bit of the structure of the court system so that a person knows you know, how to go about it and, and what goes through the normal court system, what goes through yours. Well, cases that come to me are those cases that really are assigned to the judges. And uh, the way the court system works is that you, every county has a circuit court uh, with various branches. In smaller counties, uh, like say Forest County, for example, you just have one court. In Sheboygan County, we've got five branches. Uh, you know, in Dane County, I think it's 18. I might be wrong on that, but it's in the teens. And they're responsible for those court actions that are, are filed in their circuit court. And there are various procedures people have to follow uh, to get into court. And I get that question a lot uh, from people. And I can't really give much legal advice. Uh, in fact, I'm prohibited by statute from giving any legal advice. And our clerk of court's office, and I know I'm digressing from your question, but, but they're good. I'm sure you'll get back to it. Well, I'll get back to it. And you've got to keep me on point, too. <laughs> <laughs> but the clerk of court's office has motion packets that people can, can come in and get, uh, if they want to represent themselves, and start a court action. Uh, usually it's done by lawyers, and, uh, and if it's a complicated case, you're better off with a lawyer, I think, than representing yourself. But once the case starts, it gets appointed, assigned to a judge. And what the judge does, oftentimes, is then turns around and gives <coughs> a lot of the early proceedings to the court commissioner to take care of. For example, in a divorce, once a divorce is started, uh, I will often do a temporary order hearing. And that's done within a week or two after the time a divorce has started. And at that point, you know, Things are usually pretty tense, and there aren't any arrangements for the care of the kids or the custody of the kids, responsibility for bills, and that type of thing. So they come and they see me, and I make what's called a temporary order you know, just to give them some structure in their relationship while uh, their divorce case is pending. And then once they get beyond those, those temporary stages, then they would go to the circuit court judge, for example, uh, for a final hearing if, if it's contested. And then if they don't like the decision the judge makes, then the court directors that they can go to the Court of Appeals, and after that, they can go to the State Supreme Court. Do you have the authority to close a case, or does it always have to go to one of the circuit courts? Well, I can do stipulated divorces. And uh, if a couple is getting divorced and they have a written agreement that falls within the general parameters of what the law would allow uh, in a divorce situation, then they can give me their papers, and if it looks okay, then, then I can grant the divorce. But if there are any issues that are contested, Dan, then it would have to go to the, uh, to the circuit court judge. Other cases that I would uh, see from start to finish are really pretty limited. For example, I do uh, initial appearances on traffic cases. And if somebody gets a speeding ticket, for example, they'd come and see me and I ask them for their plea. And if they say they plead guilty, then, then it's over at that point. But, uh, but generally, the cases I see from start to finish are, the, uh, are divorces, if it's stipulated. And also, I do uh, injunction hearings for domestic abuse situations and harassment situations. So if somebody were to file a request for a, an injunction, if there's domestic abuse or harassment, then uh, it starts with me and would finish with me unless there would be an appeal to a higher court. Every now and then, Terry and I'll get together and touch base on what's happening in the county and what's happening in his, in his uh, court. And I've sat in occasionally, and I've always been so impressed with the professionalism. And I know the judges, in particular, have been very impressed with the job you do. When we do touch base, it's very interesting to hear about the, the broad cases that you deal with. Could you touch a little bit on the, the different types of cases that you'll be working with on an annual basis? I take on a wide variety of cases. Uh, oftentimes, I have to go to a Memorial Medical Center in the morning because there are probable cause hearings in, in, in Chapter 51 proceedings. Those are the mental commitments. And uh, I've got some numbers here, not to bore you with statistics, but, but, but I've got them. And I did 191 of those last year, in uh, the year 2001. 191 of? Of the Chapter 51 uh, probable cause hearings. And Chapter 51 for our viewers? Well, if someone is having problems, 
and uh, perhaps the police are called, and uh, there, there's not a crime that's being committed, but maybe somebody is threatening to harm themselves, then the police will take that person into detention and take them to Memorial Medical Center. That's, uh, that's where those cases all begin. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll be evaluated by a psychiatrist. And if the psychiatrist thinks that this person is in need of, of, of care and is at risk of harm to themselves, then we would have a hearing. And because that person's freedom is really being impaired, Im, Im, infringed on by keeping them at the hospital, law requires that within 72 hours there has to be a review of that person staying at the hospital. And that's what I do. And then if I hold that person, then there has to be a final hearing within 14 days and the judge would come in and do that. So I do that, like I said, about 190 times a year. Uh, then beyond that, we've got the temporary order hearings that I mentioned earlier in divorces. Uh, that's, I did 247 in uh, last year. Uh, we talked about the stipulated divorces with Dan. I did that 162 times. Uh, bail hearings is something that I do. Uh, not every morning, but m between Tuesday and Friday, four days of the week, at 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the people that are incarcerated from the night before out at the detention center will appear by video. And uh, we'll watch them from my courtroom in room B10 of the, of the courthouse, and they'll be at the detention center about three miles away, and we'll conduct a bail hearing. And, uh, and again, I, that's on Tuesdays through Fridays. On Mondays, the circuit court judge will do those. Uh, the injunction hearings I mentioned earlier, last year I, I did 100 domestic abuse injunctions. And uh, this, I'm sorry, last year I did 62 harassment injunctions. We also do initial appearances in, in paternity cases. Uh, and then after the initial appearance, if there are genetic tests that are ordered, then they'll come back and they'll see me and we'll talk about how we can get the case resolved. That's called a pretrial conference. I, I, I do those. And uh, it, it's a pretty varied day, Adam. It keeps you on your toes. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and I'm sure our viewers now have a, a better feel for just the diverse issues that you're dealing with and the challenges there. As you go throughout the year, what cases do you find to be more routine? I know the numbers represent that a little bit, but what do you find to be a little bit more routine versus which cases uh, are the most interesting or rewarding to you? Well, the routine cases are probably the initial appearances in traffic ordinances and uh, Again, if somebody gets a speeding ticket or a defective tail lamp type of ticket, that type of thing, then uh, on Wednesdays at uh, 1.30, they'll come in and see me. And I'll ask them for their plea of, of, of guilt here, not guilty. Uh, when I first started, if somebody wanted to make a statement and, and make a pitch for a, an amendment of the ticket, I was more than happy to listen to them. And then after a whole afternoon of hearing about all these defective speedometers, I came to the conclusion it probably wasn't the right thing to do because it took all afternoon and, and it finally came to the conclusion that uh, there aren't that many really good reasons for speeding. So if somebody comes in and plays not guilty, I will uh, I'll just send their case right off to the DA or the city attorney uh, so that they can talk to the city attorney or the district attorney about their speeding ticket and maybe they can get the matter resolved there at the pretrial conference. So that's, that tends to be pretty routine. That's pretty cut and dried. As far as what's most interesting, uh, not to be redundant, but a lot of what I do is very interesting because I find people interesting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not perfect. People find themselves in stressful situations and they react in, in different ways. And I, I find that <coughs> fascinating. Uh, a lot of the things I do are involved in family law. And uh, on a typical Friday, uh, there'll be perhaps four or five weddings done in my courtroom. And then on the other hand, you got these divorces you're doing at the same time, and you look at couples and you, and you realize how happy they were at one point and you know, what happened between that point and the time that, that the divorce starts. And I don't have a good answer for you, so I hope you don't ask that question on follow-up. But uh, that's always intriguing to me. Uh, a lot of what I do is very intriguing. Now, I don't know if you mentioned earlier, you also marry people. I don't know if you our betcha. viewers are aware of that. How many couples do you marry on an annual basis, approximately? I'd say about uh, probably about 200. About 200 a year. So well, we do our weddings on Fridays between 3 and 4. <laughs> and if someone wants to sneak one in earlier, they can do it. Oh, be darn. So you, you bring people together in marriage. You also uh, perform and provide the service of mediation. Right. Tell us a little bit about the mediation program that you have in place. Well, mediation became mandated by the state back in 1988. And the experience that the courts were finding was that as more and more couples got divorced, uh, there were more and more 
disputes regarding the custody and physical placement of children. And the experience was that the courts really weren't the best place to resolve these matters because oftentimes they turn into uh, mudslinging events, unfortunately. And if you sit through one of those hearings, you'll find that every little picadillo that, that, that the other person has is gonna be brought out for good or bad. And then the court makes a decision and sends out mom and dad and tells them, okay, go parent your kids after they've been through this, this terrible situation. So the legislature felt it was best to try to get them off the court track, so to speak, inside and, and uh, get them into mediation. So they go into mediation and they uh, talk with the mediator about the issues with custody and placement to see if they can resolve it without going to court and again getting into a process that can be very damaging uh, and also very expensive. In Sheboygan, uh, you know, we, I've seen the numbers of mediation cases creeping up every year, uh, just as the number of divorces are creeping up. I think last year we referred about 295 couples to mediation and uh, I'd say about half the time they'll walk out of mediation with an agreement. And, and a lot of the couples that don't necessarily have an agreement in mediation will not end up going to court because I think mediation kind of sets the table, so to speak. And they'll come up with some resolution afterwards and they won't actually go to see the judge. But if they don't come up with a resolution, then uh, there would be a guardian ad litem that's appointed. That's an attorney who would represent the kid's best interests. Uh, there can be psychological studies ordered, that type of thing. And then the judge would make a decision on the custody <clears throat> and placement of the kids. And speaking of the, the children, uh, you also offer a program that uh, helps parents with the transition and what, what the implications might be for the children. How does that program work? Well, the statutes allow every county to have a program on the effects of divorce on children. It's not mandatory, but, but you can do it. And uh, we have a program called Remember the Children. And couples that are going through a divorce that have kids are required to go to this program. There's a $20 fee. And uh, the couples don't go together, they go separately. And the program involves a, a video and also a lot of discussion. And I hear from the people who provide the program that uh, the couples like the, like the discussion. You know, uh, divorce is not a good thing on people. They, they, really don't, they really don't deal with it real well all the time, and they really do care about their kids, and it, it's very helpful for them to be able to sit down and speak with, with their peers and, uh, and see what they're doing and how they're handling situations. So it's a four-hour program that, uh, that couples are required to go to, and uh, it's mandatory before they get divorced. You mentioned uh, you became court commissioner in 1988. Yes. There imagine it have been a number of changes over those years. What, are, what, are you, what have you seen, what have you observed as some of the key changes or trends in the department? Well, I just talked about mediation. That was a big change. That came on right after I became court commissioner. And again, that's the, that's the attitude that cases are better off resolved, not through, not through a fight in court, but rather through a, a cooperative resolution. And as I indicated before, the, the numbers have been creeping up and up and up throughout the years. Uh, another change that's related to that is mediation, not just in family court, but also other areas. We do mediation in small claims, for example. Another change I've seen and, and is the number of, of uh, people who come to, into the Sheboygan County area who are from other cultures, and, and there's a, a great need to provide interpreters for them. And, and as a compliment, I think, to Sheboygan County, that Sheboygan does attract people who are, who are looking to, to work, and it's good for us because the people that come here are oftentimes very motivated <coughs> and very industrious people. But uh, the need to provide translators is, is, is interesting at times. I had a day about, uh, boy, it was about two months ago, where in one afternoon I needed a Russian translator, a Bosnian translator, and also a Spanish translator. So that uh, has created quite a, I shouldn't say problems, we can deal with them, but it's, it's a challenge from time to time. So with the, the experience you've gained and your, the commitment you've shown to Sheboygan County, do you have any interest in uh, being a circuit court judge at some point? Well, I've tried that before, Adam. <laughs> I, uh, there are two ways you can become a judge. Uh, one is to be appointed by the governor. And back in 1990, 1990 rather, when Judge Anderson resigned, when he was elected to the Court of Appeals, uh, the Branch 4 uh, judgeship was open. And uh, I applied for that. And, uh, the pleasure of having an interview with the governor along with a couple other candidates from uh, Sheboygan County and uh, Judge Murphy, who's still on the bench, was appointed. Uh, the other uh, 
way to become judges to be elected. And in 1994, when Branch 5 was created, uh, Judge Bolgert and myself, Judge James Bolgert, ran for that position and uh, Jim won the election. And so those are the two ways to do it. Uh, I've tried in the past, and yes, I'm interested in trying again. And you touched on it earlier, but uh, what do you enjoy most about your job? It's very challenging, uh, very complex. What do you enjoy most about it? Well, the good side of any challenge is that there are rewards. And there are rewards. Uh, for example, there was a couple that came in my office a couple weeks ago. And, uh, and this is a couple I've dealt with literally for years. And, and they had a, a difficult divorce. Uh, they've been referred to mediation over and over and over again without mediation really resolving anything. And I was having a particularly a busy day that day, and it probably wasn't the best mood in the world. And this guy comes in and says, hey, I got good news for you. And, uh, and I said, what's that? And he said, uh, well, my wife and I have resolved things. And she was there, and she was smiling. And they even had their daughter now, who's about 14 or 15, and she was smiling too. So when you see people work through their problems, yeah, that, that's very rewarding, Adam. It really is. Very good. Thank I don't you. know if I had any role in their, in their case, but it, you know, you'd like to think that you do. Terry, I was thinking when you and Adam were talking for a while there, you mentioned that, what did you spend on Friday afternoons marrying people? One hour in the afternoon? And we allow 15 minutes of wedding. Okay, and, that, and that's, I had run the numbers in my head and I came out to 15 minutes of wedding. Maybe you should allow all of Friday for weddings and spend <laughs> an hour or two on the weddings so you wouldn't have so many divorces. Well, <laughs> when I book my maybe schedule. Fi maybe 50 minutes isn't enough. <laughs> when I book my schedule for March, I'll keep that in mind, Dan. Okay. <laughs> you always hear, this isn't one of the questions that, that we had talked about earlier, but oh. so, so I'm going to surprise you with one here. Uh, we always hear about a, a judge's docket. It seems to me that a lot of the things you deal with are things that are happening as you, you don't, do you have a docket that you set? Or you set aside some time for weddings, but do you have your whole day's docket set up that you have to get on the docket to see you, or, or do you take care of issues as they come up? Well, the answer is both. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got time that I, that I block aside every, you know, every December, I'll look at the calendar for the next year and I'll just block certain times off, for example, uh, I know on Wednesdays, for example, like I said, from 1.30 to, to 2.30, I'll be doing traffic appearances uh, every morning from 11 to noon. I know I'll be doing bail appearances, that type of thing. Uh, I have to keep enough time open for temporary order hearings when a divorce starts. And the reason for that, again, is things are usually pretty tense in a household, in a relationship when a divorce starts. So it's important if we can get a couple, excuse me, if we can get a couple in a court right away. So uh, there is the, uh, the flexibility there, Dan, to, to meet with problems as they arise. Also, uh, with the injunction hearings that I do, uh, the law requires that they be done within seven days. So uh, again, the flexibility has to be there to get, get a couple in uh, within seven days for their hearing. Terry, we can't have one of our department heads in for one of our shows without talking a couple minutes about their budget. Okay. And, and, and it's, it's really pertinent now with uh, the problems we're all hearing about with the, uh, the deficit in the state budget and, and how it's affecting local governments. Uh, just, a couple, just a minute or two on, on what your budget is and how some of these uh, shared revenue cuts could affect you. Well, my budget, Dan, is about uh, $250,000 a year. And of that money, about uh, $35,000, $37,000 is for operating expenses. And if I were to have to cut into my operating expenses, probably the area it would uh, affect would be mediation, for example. And I think mediation is a worthwhile uh, program. I think it's a worthwhile effort. Again, if you can get people to, to resolve their, their problems on an amicable basis without going to court and fighting, uh, everybody's further ahead. It's also, I think for the people involved, it's certainly less expensive than having to go to court to fight and I would worry about, uh, about that being impacted. Do all your revenues, where are your revenues come? Do you have revenue source other than the tax levy? Or? I have a couple revenue sources. Uh, if there is a judgment that's filed against someone in civil court, you know, let's say you're sued by, uh, well, the Sheboygan Clinic is, a, is a, a creditor that we see quite often. Let's say you got a bill with the Sheboygan Clinic and you don't pay it, and uh, there's a judgment that they get, then the clinic or any other creditor can bring someone in a court for what's called a supplemental exam. And then 
if you are the debtor, then you are required to appear in front of myself to answer questions about, uh, about your finances. And uh, that's a source of revenue. Uh, every supplemental gets a $15 fee. Mm -hmm. And uh, that runs up to several thousand dollars over the course of a year. Uh, another source of revenue we get is, uh, is from the mediation. When a couple files an action for divorce uh, by statute, a portion of that filing fee is put aside for mediation. And I think it's $25 a, per filing. And, and that helps to pay the cost of, of the mediation. Uh, also, we get money from uh, the Remember the Children program. That's self-supporting. And the money that, that's left over from, uh, you know, from paying for materials and paying the providers and goes to the county. So there, there are some uh, revenue sources. I think, if I remember right, is do you get some money from the from a, uh, when a, when people get married, they have to buy their uh, wedding license. Do, uh, isn't some of that money set aside for this mediation? Part of that is set also? aside for mediation, also. So we actually uh, get money from them when they get married, That's so that right. we can pay for the mediation down e the road. Even if they don't have kids. We Such a society we live in. You betcha. It's like a big insurance policy. <laughs> Just, we're running out of time, just in one minute, any challenges that you see in the future for the court system? Well, this kind of ties in with what you were talking about earlier, Dan, with the shared revenue, and this really isn't part of the shared revenue problem, but uh, uh, the state is uh, decreasing its uh, funding of public defender's offices, right. and by the right of the Constitution, you know, indigent people are entitled to have legal representation. So if the state isn't going to fund it through their public defender's offices, that's going to fall on, on the county. And, uh, and, and it's a shame for a lot of reasons. I think the integrity of the system requires that you have uh, you know, people who are familiar with the uh, criminal justice system who provide these services. I think our public defender's office does a great job. And uh, I, you know, I, I hate to see that obligation being pawned off on the county. And it's happening. It's happening all as across, we speak. right as we speak, as we speak. across the state. Yeah. And and if there's more budget deficits, it'll probably get worse. And because it's a constitutional obligation, it's it's something that you can't run away from. But I think that that's a, that's a real problem that I see. Well, thank you, Terry. It's been very interesting for me, and I'm sure for our viewers. Hopefully, uh, most of our viewers won't have to uh, uh, use your services or or the court system. But uh, I think we have a better understanding now of, of what's available. Well, when people come to court, I try to tell them it's not as bad as going to the dentist, but I'm not sure that's always true. Well, I've been to the dentist the last couple weeks. Right. I haven't been to the car system. I'm happy I went to the dentist. So. Okay, well, thanks, Dan. <laughs> Next month, our guest is going to be Tim Finch, our finance director. And we're going to be talking about the uh, governor's proposal to deal with the deficit, a $1.1 billion deficit in Madison, and how it will affect your Boyne County. So this will be a very interesting program. Uh, we almost bumped you, Terry, this month because it was, it was immediate, but uh, uh, I'm glad we had you and, and we learned a lot, and next month we'll talk about our budget problems. Okay, thanks so, again. And, and thank, thank you to our viewers for watching.